In today's video, we are going to go over the H-Bomber guy's video comments. Because in the comments section, there was a lot of interesting stories about Tommy. Some people who used to work with him, some that worked on Video Games Live, and just some people wrote some really funny stuff. And I figured, instead of having you scroll through all the thousands and thousands of comments, I'll post in this video the ones I found to be the most interesting. So we'll start off first with the this long one, and I'll read, I'll read the, the full comments just because some people don't want to watch the screen and just want to listen to the video. And this one is from uh, a random user who says, I can't believe I have a story to tell on an H Bomber Guy video, but here it goes. The short version of the story is, I unknowingly performed in a video game's live concert and along with the entire rest of the orchestra, never got paid for it. The time is January 2015 and the place is Oberlin College in Ohio. The college has a music conservatory and I was dating a classical trombonist getting his degree from the conservatory. I was a sophomore majoring in art history at the college, but I also played the cello for fun. January at Oberlin is called winter term, and it's a month in which students are free to undertake short-term creative or academic projects before the spring semester begins. My then boyfriend alerted me to a winter term project that a classical conducting major at the conservatory was doing, putting together an orchestral performance of video game soundtrack music. The conductor was accepting volunteers from the college and conservatory to join the, his orchestra. No and no auditioning required. We both joined, believing it would be a fun chance to play music together and pass the time during the coldest month of the year. The rehearsals were clunky because many of us were more skilled than the others, and plenty of us were not taking the process seriously. But, but this didn't really trouble me. After all, I was under the impression throughout the rehearsal period that this was simply a conducting students' creative and fun idea for gaining more practical experience conducting an ensemble. And that the performance at the end of the month would be just like any other the countless free concerts that take place at the Oberlin campus year-round. Fast forward to the day of the performance. To my surprise, we took a bus out of the town to a neighboring city, Lorraine. It's not a big city, so I didn't expect much. We were ushered into a performing arts auditorium, which seemed far too big of a venue for such a humble, ragtag band of college musicians. There appeared to be professional lighting, and we were fitted with an apparatus I'd never used before, tiny electronic earpieces which would help us keep time during the performance. I was already feeling confused and uneasy when the audience started to pour into the auditorium and fill seemingly every seat. I realized the concert was not a low-key affair whatsoever and that each audience member had likely paid for tickets. How much, I had wondered. As the concert began, a charismatic and energetic man, that must be Tommy, that I had never seen before introduced himself to the audience and hyped them up. I remember thinking he seemed a little slimy. A little used car salesman-y, but I brushed it off. Only during this time on stage did I realize that the performance was part of a tour called Video Games Live, and it seemed like a well-established event. Stage lights flash and video footage of the various video games played on the screen behind us to accompany each song. I felt, I felt completely out of my depth during the whole performance, but the audience didn't seem to care about our imperfect playing. They were having the time of their lives. After the performance, I felt strange and somewhat embarrassed for reasons I couldn't understand. My then-boyfriend, on the other hand, was furious. He felt like he had been misled about the scale of the project and ought to, have been, ought to have been paid for being part of the orchestra. At the time, I thought he was overreacting and needing to lighten up a bit. Within the first few days of the spring semester, life was back to normal and we had put both the bizarre experience behind us. In retrospect, I fully agree with how he felt. We gave hours of rehearsal time over a month with no understanding of what we were actually involved in. Instead of receiving any payment for our time and efforts, whoever organized the concert series was free to make rake in all the cash all the money and it from the expensive tickets that were for the sold-out event. Our willingness to make music together for fun was seemingly exploited to provide entertainment for a paying audience. And to be clear, the lack of compensation is one problem, but the lack of clarity about what we were rehearsing for is an even bigger problem in my eyes. It's possible that I might have missed something along the way, and if so, I take responsibility for not being more observant, but I feel confident enough about what I remember to share it here as such, my recollections and experience. Now that I have watched this expose on Tommy Talorico, who I previously knew nothing about, but who very well may have been the same man who introduced us on stage all those years ago, though I cannot remember for certain, in his propensity to pathologically lie, to take credit for work he, he did not do, and to choose showmanship above anything else, that strange month of my life makes infinitely more sense. So an interesting story here, and Video Games Live always advertise that they use local symphonies or orchestras and all that but 
they never, I guess they wouldn't advertise it, but it is kind of slimy that they kind of, they tricked people into doing this instead of making it clear. I would think that they would have a contract or something like when people signed off saying you're doing this on a volunteer basis because some of the music and some of the, the shows I know are recorded and used for promotional material or he even sells the live shows on back in the day on CD and DVDs. So a bit slimy. This one's from DM Gaina. He says, I worked with Amico and had several calls with Tommy during the process of developing games. Overall, yeah, a lot of it went horribly wrong with the system and marketing. Hell, our prototype console was a bunch of random components in a cardboard box. I am not making this up. We had cables attached to a cardboard box under a PC monitor. But it was a real passion project for Tommy and he always was 100% behind it. He felt like that Tommy wanted this thing to succeed and be a fun console for absolutely everyone still have a lot of insight in the projects in the system. If you're curious, just ask me anything about it. For legal reasons, I cannot disclose which projects or companies I have worked with. Toxic has said, I'm so curious about this, but I don't even know where to start specifically. I like I expected it to be probably old tech wise, the way he was waxing nostalgic about it. It felt almost like he was trying to barely update a SNES or Atari style console. The controller on the pitch video in the that brick shape and that boxy design of that console and the all in the same room just gave me a gaming of the 70s 80s vibe but components in a box is hilariously awful i don't even know what to say like was it ever functional in any way did this box even turn on like i have a box of parts it won't do uh i didn't click read more so i don't know what else it says he was always super nostalgic about it and basically he wanted to have others relive his gaming childhood moments like snes and yes were never part of any topics it was either intelligent gaming of the past or in general gaming in the past He's strictly against online play with other people. However, he wanted to have an online leaderboard and a physical achievement system to recreate a similar feeling to an Nintendo Power where you can submit a high score and get a price in return. So he dreamed about having certificates sent out to the players' small goodies, which is indeed a cute idea, but a logistical problem. And for some reason, I did not click, click, click read more, so I don't have the rest of that comment to read off, but the basics of it is it seems like Tommy was stuck in the past. Marshall wrote, I actually went to the guy's house when I was a kid, ironically sometime in 2012 or 2013. Because my mom's boyfriend at the time was one of Tommy's executives and it was so surreal watching the, this H-Bomber guy's video featuring the rooms I had been in like 9 years ago. I had completely forgotten about his and his house's existence and I never thought I'd see someone I vaguely remember in my childhood appearing in one of my favorite YouTuber's videos. Thanks Henry. And the follow-up comments have Marshall saying, and by executive, I mean he just organized stuff for the video games live concerts. That guy in the corner had said, man, just seeing photos from inside my friend's house or convention centers I've been to is wild. To me, that sounds whack. I like the, the lingo. It's whack. Marshall responds with, yeah, and something that Henry didn't really touch on, probably because there's not much record of people caring, is the fact that the house is just ridiculously dusty. I had really annoying allergies as a kid, and being there for two or three hours that I was there killed me. Looking back, it made me realize that half the stuff he bought was probably to make it seem like he cared deeply about the nerdy stuff he did for his job, when in actuality he bought it only because he could. He also says, by the way, I just watched the video on a second time through my with my mom and she brought up a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know. She was around Tommy and Video Games Live crew a lot more than I was. Apparently the Miyamoto stuff might actually be somewhat true as my mom recalled meeting one of the Mario devs who was hanging out with Tommy in the backstage of Comic Con 2013 or in video game or in Dubai when Video Games Live was doing one of their shows there. I don't remember which locations she said. So that comment uh we'll go back to the, the house. The we've seen how dusty and dirty it is. One of his tour videos where he goes through his kitchen, I, I remember because they had like a some type of fossil or dinosaur thing or something he lifted up and and you could see like the the counter looked like it was white but it was actually red it just had so much dust and all his little knickknacks i can only imagine a nightmare of how much it would take to clean up that house and we know that he does have animals in his house or he did maybe not anymore we'll we'll find out about that i guess down the road but it's a really dirty house and i don't doubt that he had people from Nintendo hanging out with him because he did work with Nintendo so Miyamoto though on the other hand uh, doubt Noah Waters says I had friends who played for video games live touring shows with symphonic music tend to hire local usually university students as the classical instrument players while the touring group consists of the core rhythm section and sound crew 
I can remember clearly I was rather glad I didn't take the gig because they didn't want to pay and only after some badass threatened to involve the union did the checks rapidly appear. So there, the, there you go. Another person saying that they would go on tour and just try to get free help. You would think they'd pay, even if it's not much. Just something for someone's time. F. Jardim 14 says, I worked as a press, I worked as press and covered a video games live concert in Brazil 2009. Brief, briefly met Talarico backstage. Now, I didn't see him use any illegal substances, but he was certainly wired. Guessing he's hinting that he was on the cocaine. And his neck was so taut, I can hear the tendons creaking. He could not shut up about wanting to be taken to a brothel the minute the shows was out. The venue manager later told me that they had secret rule to never leave anyone alone with them, especially women. I was in my big I'm a gamer phase back then, and it was a colossal letdown. Well, those are some strong uh, accusations, and he had edited the post, so he definitely went over it, so he meant what this uh, person wrote. Now, we can't. <laughs> this is all speculation, so we have no idea if this is true or not. There has been some mentionings of Tommy fancying the, the younger ladies, but who knows? But uh, another another very damning story, if true. Chicken Ring, New York City, says, One of the orchestras I sometimes played with presented video games live a few years ago with Tommy. I'm a lifelong gamer, but never heard of the guy. As an orchestral musician, I've played many of these prepackaged Pops concerts. They're almost always fun because they're low-pressure, easy, and we put them together on one or two rehearsals and then bang them out. I'm certain we were half drunk for this one, and of course we had a good time because the video game music has a lot of percussion, but damn... I saw through Tommy instantly, a total poser, self-aggrandizing nobody. I was just glad to take his money. So there you go. So somebody had a good time doing the concert, and they were paid. Twilight Waker of Time says, This was so wild. When I was 17, I played harp for video games live with a local orchestra. I met Tommy Tallarico, and he was pretty nice since I showed up to a concert in a Zelda cosplay and was a kid. At the time, I wanted to go... I wanted to get into the gaming industry with music, and he promised he would hook me up with some people to get me involved. He never answered my email. I'm starting to think maybe that was for the best. He also didn't even pretend to be sorry for, for forgetting me when I reintroduced myself after playing in video games live again four years later. I didn't care, but my friends were offended on my behalf, lol. Fungers says, I worked in the video game industry a few years ago, including the video games live, with video games live. My contact, you can guess who, was a whore to work with. They were ex extraordinarily rude, entitled, incompetent, and couldn't care less about their customers. They would frequently make mistakes in critical information and then come back furious and blaming us for doing exactly what they had instructed because they forgot what promises they had sold and their customers pointed it out. To make it worse, this work we did to deliver on their promises was for free because a biz dev guy said we would. The polar opposite of this was the Grim Dawn folks. They were extremely thankful, gracious, and kind. At one point, they said something like, The thing that we care most about is that our customers are maximally happy. Clam Errol Pearson says, I once played violin in the orchestra for a video games live concert. The conductor was a good guy from what I remember. From the few interactions I had with Tommy, he seemed only interested in self-aggrandizement, uh, hopefully I said that right, fan service and spectacle. He never expressed any actual artistic interest in the music we were playing. Knowing all about him years later makes it an even weirder experience to look back on. It was still a fun concert. The Hail theme rocked. This one's from Court Jester. Wow, really impressed all around. I met Tommy a, new, a number of times as Video Games Live began taking off. I was, and am still, part of a gaming news site and recall him reaching out to us personally in an effort of correcting something or other. Eventually, our group was extended invitations to attend Video Games Live Chicago as VIP, with backstage access, etc. What wasn't said until after everyone traveled across the U.S. and arrived to the theater was that he expected anyone attending with comp tickets to work for free, shilling things in the lobby, setting up, cleaning up, etc. Afterwards, the guy bragging of his Ferrari in his mansion in the same breath asked these same guests, unpaid workers, to taxi him around because, and that's where you would insert a flimsy excuse inside there. He also skipped out on any of the bill later that night when we all went out to eat. A few years later, attending either E3 or GDC, he invited us to cover the Gang Awards and attend their related festivities. About 10 wards in, I was suspicious enough from an obvious pattern of winners nominees to do a bit of legwork from the audience and essentially discovered what was revealed in this video these were awards being received by the same people handing them out a great big phony industry circle jerk bit 
like buying oneself a birthday present. At least I did get introduced to some wonderful other people and a few personal heroes through it all. Not by Tommy, just merely through attending. Not saying he doesn't have talent, he's clearly gifted musically, but it seems he's also clearly a grifter of sorts. I don't know about the gifted mu musically, but that first part of that comment, where he expected everyone to help him out for free, sounds awfully familiar of our uh, Amico coverage of the Crayola event. I wonder how Retrobro feels. It seems like Retrobro got suckered in like this guy did. So this one's from at Dowd Alzair. I met Talrico when I sang in a local choir for a video games live concert. I didn't directly interact with him, but he radiated cringe. A specific incident I remember is that we were rehearsing Baba Yetu from Civilization, which was in Swahili. The music director was trying to get us to sing with a different kind of tone, and Talarico yelled, Sing it like you got a bone in your nose! The music director ignored him and kept talking, so he repeated himself louder. Nobody laughed, a fact which seemed to surprise him. Ah, that's that sounds like a type of Talarico humor, being completely oblivious to uh, the, race, the racial connotation of what he just said. I believe this story. Okay, this one's from Tommy T. Wait a minute, Tommy T7555. I don't know about that name. Not that it matters, but I thought I'd share. I played for Video Games Live back in 2016, 2017. It was a fun time. Tommy came to the final couple of rehearsals and took the time to talk to any of us who wanted to, which I really appreciated as a musician, where most of the headliner talent runs off the stage as soon as we, as their obligations are done. I told him how much fun the parts he arranged were for my instrument and we chatted a bit about Halo and how formative its soundtrack had been for both of us. We also talked about Nine Inch Nails Quake soundtrack and how important it was to appreciate the compositional limitations of older software and how we can learn from and incorporate those ideas into current video game music. But anyways, I got, a super I got super good vibes from the guy and never would ever imagine all of this. In retrospect, I see that him being the big name celebrity chatting with the local musicians was probably a major perk of the gig. He gets to be the big successful guru that all of us small patios want to chat with. He struck me as a, someone who was a real sucker for the limelight. And who could blame him? He really enjoyed himself putting on those shows and I had a great time. Shame about all that I've learned tonight. So there we go. I had someone with a positive experience with Tommy. This one's an interesting one. This one's from Scott Barrett IHQ, who I believe was the developer of Bomb Squad. He's popped up in some YouTube comments in the past and it's kind of uh, he said some things that are positive about Tommy but he's also has made it quite aware that the Amico was not functioning properly and that's why there was input lag and the difficulties they had developing for the console so let's see what he writes here so Scott says well that was a tour de force a real spectacular breakdown a really fascinating examination of someone who I've known for a long time I'm not here to refute or confirm anything, but I can say this. I was in the room when the oof was recorded. Doubt. That's me saying doubt. It was, he didn't say doubt. I, I, I like how all these people remember the, the sound effect of how oof was recorded. It's just a, a one of the thousands of sound effects used in the game. Why is this one so special? It's just, it's, not, it's nothing. It's just a, a hit, like someone getting contacted. Like the, I'm pretty sure the guy who designs Madden's sound effects doesn't remember oh yeah mad in 2002 when somebody gets tackled by the on their legs uh i finally remember that moment like people i don't know let's just read what he says i, I have serious doubt that he was there i wrote the intro animation for messiah and was directing the six-year-old girl who voiced bob i was collecting really just for the intro but was aware that any hit sound could be used anywhere in the game i had written oof and ow as an indicator that she should do a series of hit sounds being six, she read it literally, and everyone in the room had a laugh when she did. I Facebook messaged with her dad recently, and she's aware of the oof popularity, and I don't think she wants her identity exposed, so I won't do that here. My recollection of this sound recording session is that Tommy was there, myself, the girl, and her dad, and I'm sorry I can't recall if Joey was in the room. As well, there was another shiny guy and his father who played God for the Peace. Tommy or possibly Joey set the mic for her, set a level, and hit record, and probably to dat. I assume the recording in its entirety was sent to Joey who would have set an EQ compression and maybe a bit of a down pitch to make her more male sounding and then chopped it in bits for me to lay into the intro sequence. I realized I'm not providing much more information but that's all it was. Well apparently he worked on the game so maybe he was around but once again how 
a game from so many years ago that at the time nobody you're not gonna remember a random sound like this this sounds i i don't believe this that's just my opinion and some other people wrote that still generally interesting and i'm glad she knows about the sound though i totally get why she doesn't want to be publicly put her name on it and ram ram papia are you doing a talarico here so i'm not the only one who doesn't uh buy this story Scott responds, some people in her circle know about it, but I gather. But yeah, it would be weird suddenly having fans for something like this. It was a pretty funny recording session, honestly. Trying to get your typical injury sounds was definitely tough with her. Something with adults doing this kind of sound effect. There's some physical contact like mild stomach punching from someone in the room to elicit or inspire the oofs. Of course, none of us can do that to a six-year-old, so I remember she took it upon herself to try to unsuccessfully punch herself to get her those sounds out, but ended up just looking adorable like a kitten with a slow and threatening squat. So we only got the literal oof spoken and we all thought it was funny and moved on to other dialogue. Fun fact for me, I have no idea I was listening to the credits for that sound effects library until seeing this video. So this guy is saying that the kid punched herself in the stomach to make the oof sound. This this reeks of uh, Talarico fabrication. I, it's just my personal opinion. Write in the comments of this if you, if I, maybe I'm just somebody who, can, who can't believe anything. And maybe it is believable. Just you let me know. And uh, he also writes, it sounds like that. I do apologize. I could get someone from Guinness to confirm. I posted that Messiah video 12 years ago and actually bought, I mean, one a Guinness record for the least views received on a video that's been posted for 12 years. And then another record for the guy who understands the YouTube algorithm for popularity. Proud moments. Okay. Some comedy from Scott. Uh, yeah, as I said, I don't, I don't buy this. 